Hi, everybody. Welcome to our uh, session today here in the White Coat Investor Facebook group. We're going to give people a few minutes to come in here. So uh, give it give it just a minute here, just like any good webinar. Um, but welcome. This is going to be a, a great time. We've got Andrew Paulson here of studentloanadvice.com. And a lot of questions from you guys that we've already collected and hoping to get more during the session today. So let me bounce over there to the Facebook group and make sure this is actually happening. All right, there we go. It looks like it's working. So uh, as soon as we get a few people in here, we'll get started. Awesome. How are you doing, Andrew? We are doing great. Uh, you know, look, looking forward to talking with, with everyone today and, and trying to, to figure out, you know, what, what, what to do right now with, with their student loans, given some of the uncertainty that's going around. But we're doing well. Um, we're just getting ready for a move. We just purchased a home. So uh, looking forward to, to moving uh, here in a few weeks, just, just locally here in the Utah area. So Awesome. Well, congratulations on that. Um, all right. Well, uh, we're starting to get people streaming in. So let's go ahead and get started. I think the first thing we need to address in this session is the big question on everybody's minds with student loans right now, which is, does the government really mean it when they say student loans, you got to start paying again and you got to start paying interest again come October 1st? And uh, what are your thoughts on that, Andrew? Yeah, you know, I, I wish I had the exact answer right now and could give everyone the comfort that, yes, loans are going to get pushed back until December. Or loans are gonna, you know, be, be starting October first. What we do know is that come October, payments are going to be reinstated. And you know what we're talking to clients right about in the, in the consultations is is to plan accordingly as such. But you know there is a chance that that they could get extended. You know, given all the different facts in terms of you know Fed loan, Granite State, a number of loan servicers have, have are quitting, and you know potentially with with another you know, variant coming into, into play, mixing things up. But I would plan right now that payments are going to get started in October. Unless you hear otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And if I do, I will be sure to let you all know that there has been changes. So. Yeah, it's not going to be subtle. If it gets changed, we're going to be blasting it so everybody knows on all the White Coat Investor social media and posts and so on and so forth. There's talk of extending it to December, the end of December. I've even heard talk of extending it as late as March 31st. Um, but that's as far as I've heard people talking about it. And, you know, the fact is fewer and fewer people are talking about it. And people more and more left on the political spectrum are talking about it. I don't feel like it's uh, across the political spectrum anymore. I feel it's mostly pretty far left, the people talking about it, extending it to March 1st. Um, so I'm pretty skeptical. I, I think it's probably going to go through as under current law, under current guidelines, and you're going to be owing interest come October 1st. Um, so that's probably, if I still had student loans, that's what I'd be planning on right now. Just realize that there's a chance that that could change and, uh, and nobody's got a working crystal ball and can really tell you if it's going to or not. I know as we've met with some of our student loan refinancing partners, many of them uh, think it's more likely than not that it'll be extended at least a little bit. Uh, but again, they're just guessing as well. And uh, my guess would be that it's not going to be extended this time. But who knows? It's been 18 months now, you know, um, and there's very little keeping them from extending it again if they really want to. All right. The other question that's big on people's minds is the whole forgiveness thing. And I'm not talking about public service loan forgiveness. I'm not talking about, you know, going and working for the National Health Service Corps or the military or the Indian Health Services. I'm not even talking about IDR forgiveness after 20 or 25 years. I'm talking about just across the board, we're going to forgive a bunch of student loans. And there have been proposals that come out. They typically come out from folks like Elizabeth Warren, people more on the left side of the political spectrum. Um, they've batted around numbers like getting $10,000 forgiven. They've even talked about getting the first $50,000 of federal student loans forgiven. What do you think, Andrew? Is it going to happen? Is it going to happen anytime soon? Is it something people should plan on? 
Yeah, uh, that's that's another thing that I would not put my chips in on that. If I'm not a betting man, but, but if I were, I would say that there's probably not going to be any any loan forgiveness, you know, given that's just a ten thousand know, dollar payoff of, of your student loans. And, you know, for so many of our listeners and readers, it's not going to make that large of a dent in your med school, dental school, pharmacy school, student loans. Um, but, you know, on on the campaign trail, President Biden talked about, hey, you know, doing some type of, of forgiveness. And it, it's probably been about ten thousand dollars is what they've talked about mostly. But I would not uh, put my chips in on that. But, you know, if you were going to private refinance your loans, you could leave ten thousand dollars federal just in case that ends up coming. But I, I wouldn't bet on that. I don't think I'd bet on it either. Here's the deal, right? For most of the people in this group that have student loans, $10,000 doesn't move the needle. You know, you owe two hundred, three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars $300,000, The $10,000 should not change your student loan plan. Yes, it's a nice little icing on the cake, but really shouldn't change your plan. You might be paying more than that just in interest in a given year. You know, so $10,000 is a non-starter for doctors. Now, it's mm -hmm. great for people who have more typical student loans. If you owe 20,000, 10,000 is huge. Um, but if you owe 400,000, it just doesn't move the needle. $50,000 is a little bit more money, obviously. Mm -hmm. but still, if you owe 250, 300, 350,000, you can't plan your whole student loan strategy around hope that it's just going to yeah. be forgiven. Um, I think 50,000 is very unlikely. The only people I hear talking about that, again, are pretty liberal senators. Uh, the president certainly hasn't shown any inclination to approve a fifty thousand um, dollar student loan forgiveness policy across the board. He, whenever he talks about it, which is pretty rare these days, ten thousand is the only number I ever hear come out of his mouth, even while he was on the campaign trail. Mm -hmm. So I really don't think you should be counting on that. But again, if you want to to bet that way, you can always keep ten or fifty thousand dollars of your federal student loans, not refinance them, and let them sit there and hope that they'll be forgiven. But yeah. I think you're much better off taking control of your financial life, uh, you know, and either planning on going for forgiveness if you're in a really bad situation, maybe IDR forgiveness, or getting these things paid off yourself. All right, I wanted to spend also a few minutes making sure people understood the deals that are available right now uh, on refinancing. One is through White Coat Investor. If you refinance between now and the end of October through the links on the White Coat Investor site, which not only give you a a great interest rate, but they give you a better deal than you can go get going directly to the companies because you get hundreds of dollars in cash back. But we also are currently throwing in our flagship online course, Fire Your Financial Advisor. And so that uh, is, you know, an $800 value, $799 value that you get in addition to the cash back, in addition to getting a lower interest rate, in addition to getting better service on your student loans. Um, so that's a sweetener that we've thrown in. You have to refinance at least sixty thousand dollars alone, uh, of, in order to get that. It used to be a hundred thousand. We've lowered that to sixty thousand. Most of you are refinancing at least sixty thousand dollars when you refinance, so that shouldn't be a very big issue. Two of the lenders have special deals going right now as well. Uh, I think the better one is from Common Bond. They are offering zero percent, and not just through October thirty-first. They're offering it for six months. They require a few things though. They require you to have at least one federal loan. And uh, and they also, um, shoot, I can't read my writing. But they, oh, oh they, it has to be either a 10 or a 20 year 20 loan. Year they're and they're yeah. only gonna offer you one of these two. But if they only offer you a 20 and you want a 10, email Cindy at whitecoatinvestor.com and she can get you swapped from a 20 into a 10. Um, so that's, uh, that's one, one way you can do that with Common Bond. The other thing you can do is with SoFi, they have a little bit of a different deal. Their deal is 0% through October 1st, just like the federal loans, but the loan's actually not finalized until October 1st. So you can actually cancel the refinance. If for some reason the feds come along and they go, you know what, we're gonna extend this to March 31st, um, then you can go ahead and get that. Uh, you can cancel it and you can just go right back to your federal loans because it's not actually dispersed until October 1st. Of course, that means you don't get the cash back. You don't get fire your financial advisor until October 1st, but it basically gives you the option to back out if the feds change. So 
uh, mm -hmm. that's pretty pretty sweet deal. Keep in mind that is not available with their resident deal, right? SoFi is one of the companies that will refinance loans for residents and limit your payments to just $100 a month. And you can't have that deal and this 0% deal. It's one or the other. So keep that in mind. Um, Jim, and yeah. I was just I was just going to say like on on the refinancing thing what we've been talking about with clients is they could do the SoFi or the common bond deal and let's say that they could get a lower interest rate from Laurel Road or you know one of the other lend private lenders out there and you could lock in that 6 month you know 0% on common bond get get the bonus get fire your financial advisor and then maybe you could end up private refinancing you know, in six months from now, what's that January of, of next year and getting an even lower interest rate. So just something else to keep on mind for those of you who are looking to private refinance. Yeah. Uh, obviously, we don't know what interest rates are going to do. It could be lower. Right. Yeah, you it know? could be lower. It could go up too. So. It's one of the fascinating things with some of the people that have taken variable student loans over the years. And, uh, and of course, when interest rates drop, their interest rate goes down. And so there's a number of white coat investors out there with uh, student loan interest rates under 1% right now, mm -hmm. just because they refinanced into a variable loan that was two and a half percent and then rates dropped further. So uh, one of the advantages, a lot of people forget, they just think about the risk of taking a variable loan, but there are advantages uh, to doing that as well. Uh, the other thing I was trying to remember about Common Bond's deal, Common Bond is not taking 1099 income right now. So you basically have to have a W-2. Uh, maybe you can talk them into a K-1, but I wouldn't I wouldn't count on it. You're probably going to need to be an employee right now to refinance with Common Bond. All right. We've got a number of questions we collected before this session. Uh, we're going to be watching for your questions. If you put any questions in, um, just type them in as a comment in the Facebook group uh, right there underneath this video, and we'll get to those. Um, but uh, otherwise, we're just going to answer the ones that were submitted in advance. So our first one comes from Ryan Hunley, and it's the classic federal student loans refinance now or wait until October 1st. Now, in light of everything we just talked about, these special deals, uh, uncertainty knowing what the federal, uh, what's going to happen with Fed loans, uncertainty what's going to happen with this uh, deadline for the 0% student loan holiday. What's the bottom line, Andrew? Should they refinance now or should they wait until October 1st? I'm going to give the worst answer. It depends. <laughs> you sure you're um, not an attorney? <laughs> I, I know. And it's, we just, I, I don't know what your student loan situation is. Are, are you in a situation where your, you know, your, your student loans are a hundred thousand dollars and you're going to be making $400,000 in a private practice? Well, that's a, that's a shoe in for somebody that just private refinances. Or are you just starting your journey? Are you in your intern year and you're planning on being a hospitalist and you're going to have, you know, student loans that are three or four times your your uh, income in the future. You know, and if that was the case, I'd be keeping them. Uh, you know, federal uh, and in going for for public service loan forgiveness. But if you're in the refinance camp, uh, you know what you could do is if if you went ahead and you went onto White Coat Investors site and you got a couple of quotes from some of the private lenders, they give you thirty to sixty days to move on move move forward on that quote, and you could see if there is some type of if the loan moratorium gets pushed back or if there is some type of loan forgiveness forgiven it comes through all right here's another question this one comes in from dan antler who asked older parents ready to retire with parent loans what would be the next steps to reduce payments i'm, I'm not a big fan of parents borrowing quite yeah. honestly but there are some unique strategies if you have relatively old people with low income borrowing student loans. Mm -hmm. uh, what would you tell someone if they're getting ready to retire and they have student loans for their kids still? Yeah. So the, this parent, Dan probably has parent plus loans that they took on behalf of their child. So they are in charge of paying the loans off. They're probably uh, federal parent plus loans. And, you know, the option that you have is to be enrolled in a couple of uh, repayment plans standard, graduated, extended. And if they did a direct federal consolidation, they could be an income contingent repayment. Um, so you, you, there is opportunity for an income driven repayment plan. I'm not a huge fan of income contingent repayment as it's a legacy repayment plan. Repay and pay and IBR tend to be better. Um, but what they could do is, you know, if they had Roth money saved up, they could, they could take out, you know, more Roth money distributions when they retire 
because that would then keep their taxable income lower because your student loan payment and income driven repayment is based on what's showing up on their tax return. What is their adjusted gross income? So example, if they took out a hundred thousand dollars from a 401k, let's say that was pre-tax dollars, well, that hundred thousand is going to show up on their tax return and then their student loan payment is going to be based upon that. Now let's say they take out, you know, 80,000 out of a Roth account and then 20,000 out of a, a pre-tax account when they retire, then it would only, you know, on their tax return, it's going to show that they took out about $20,000. So that's a, that's a way that they could end up uh, reducing their student loan payment, you know, kind of playing that game of pulling from some pre-tax and some post-tax accounts. Um, the other option that they have is they could do what's called a, a double consolidation with their parent plus loans. And that would be able to get them from income contingent repayment, which is based on 20% of their discretionary income. So assuming $100,000 of income, they would pay about uh, 20%, I'm trying to do the numbers on my head. So about $20,000 of student loan payments. But if they were in pay as you earn, they could cut that payment in half. So they'd only have to make $10,000 of payments. And that is through a double consolidation. If you have more questions on that, we'd be happy to show you how to do that in the console. Awesome. And that kind of goes for everything we're talking about today. If, if you're in a complicated situation, you just need some advice, or you just want someone to confirm that what you're doing is right, you can book a session with Andrew. Just go to studentloanadvice.com. It's really easy there. Uh, spend an hour with him. Let him spend some time with your situation and give you personalized uh, coaching and advice uh, with regard to managing your student loans. All right, our next question comes from Nicole, uh, whose first question is, for those who have FedLoan as their servicer, what do you see happening with PSLF after FedLoan's contract is up this December? Can you first of all talk a little bit about what's actually happening with FedLoan and then seeing if you can answer her question? Yeah, I, I'm sure that a lot of people have seen the news in the last month or so that FedLoan is going to be quitting uh, federal student loan servicing and that is effective middle of December. So what does that mean for the 9 million people that are currently getting their loan serviced by Fed loan? They're going to be switched to another loan servicer. We don't know exactly who it is, but it's likely to be, you know, Bohila, Great Lakes, uh, Navy, one of the other uh, federal loan servicers that are out there. And they have said that they're going to ensure that there is a smooth handoff of that. Uh, that remains to be seen just as, you know, part of the reason why they're getting out of this, this business is I just don't think they've done that great of a job, particularly with the public service loan forgiveness program. And, you know, it's, there's a lot of people out there that have had lots of headaches going through this program. And they are currently the only, the exclusive loan servicer for public service loan forgiveness. So those of you who are doing PSLF are, you're going to have your loan servicer switched. And you know, I wonder if this is a play by Fed loans to just get more money from the government. Do you think this is just posturing that the government will end up throwing more money at them and, and come the end of the year, they're still in business? Yeah. So, you know, through their federal contract that they're getting paid, right, they're saying we're stepping out. We've got nine million people and maybe they're trying to use that as leverage to then end up getting a better, you know, more lucrative contract government. So yeah, that, that could be some potential. So. Yeah, it wouldn't surprise me a bit. All right, Nicole's follow-up question was, if you plan to pay off your federal loans before 10 years of qualified payments, PSLF, would you refinance? Understanding that refinancing would make you ineligible to apply for PSLF. Well, if your loans are paid off in less than 10 years, you're not going to get anything forgiven. No. That, that's, that's not the way it works. I mean, you either make, you pay as little as possible and try to get as much as you can forgiven in PSLF. And the usual strategy to do that is to be in training for years and years making payments, right? These payments you've made the last 18 months, zero dollars, the payments you make as an intern, a resident, a fellow, those are the ones that allow you to have something to forgive. If you don't even start making payments, if you're in uh, deferment or forbearance during your residency and fellowship, and then you come out and you have a typical physician student loan burden and a typical physician income, you're gonna pay off your student loans in less than 10 years. There's gonna be nothing left yeah. to forgive. Yeah. Um, so keep that in and, mind. I mean, and it's on, one or the other there. And on top of that, why would you keep that 7% interest rate when you could go and you could get two, two and a half percent interest rate on your FET, on your student loans, right? You know, example, they come out of school with a hundred thousand dollars of student loans at a 7% interest rate that's growing $7,000 a year. Well, if you private refinance that to 3%, you know, that's saving you at least $4,000. 
over those 10 years. So, you know, it, it doesn't make sense if you're going to end up getting to the 10 years and there's nothing left to be forgiven, you know, probably just private refinance, get those done, live like a resident. So. Yeah, you're, you're going down the wrong pathway if, you, if you're going for PSLF, but then you realize you're not going to have anything left to forgive in 10 years. Uh, you, you are not managing your student loans optimally if that's the case. So, um, All right, next question from Ricky Rosella. If I made the decision to invest instead of paying off debt like student loans, are there any situations you've seen where that financial plan turned out badly? I think maybe I'll take this one. What I see happen is people say, oh, my student loans are only at 3%. My student loans are only at 4%. Surely I expect more than that out of my investments. I mean, if I don't get more than that out of my investments, I got a bigger problem than my student loans. And that math works out every day of the week and twice on Sunday. You know, it's true. If you can make 10% while borrowing at 4%, that's mathematically great. The problem people run into is they keep telling themselves that. They buy a new Tesla at 1.5%. They've got their student loans at 4%. They buy a big fat doctor mortgage at 3.5%. They borrow to get their couch at 6%. And each time they go, well, I expect to earn more than that out of my investments. But the problem is they are not actually putting the money into their investments. They're spending it. And when you do that, that's when you come out behind. Um, now, most of the time, long term, your investments are going to do better in two, three, four, five percent. But the truth is, most of us are people, and we are not going to invest, even if we invest some of that money that we don't use to buy whatever because we bought it on credit, um, or we use to invest instead of uh, you know paying down student loans. Most of us aren't going to put it all toward the investments, and so we actually come out behind. It's a behavioral finance thing, so I'd be really careful with that. It really bothered me, even when I had relatively low interest debt, when I realized that money's fungible. And basically everything I was buying, all my vacations, all my stuff, all the money I'd waste, I was basically borrowing at two and a half, three percent to do that. You know, I think my mortgage was 2.75%. And I just wasn't willing to borrow at 2.75% to go on vacation. And so once I paid that off, I felt a lot more free to just waste money, to give it away to charity, to go on vacations, to buy stuff, whatever, um, because I knew I wasn't borrowing any money. And uh, so if you feel that way about it, then I would recommend paying off your debt. Um, but it's a balance for most people. Most people uh, do something like max out their retirement accounts, and then rather than starting a taxable account, the rest goes towards their student loans or toward their mortgage. Or they put together a plan to pay off their student loans in, say, four years. You know, they figure, hey, if I win the military, I'd be out of debt in four years. So I'm going to try to pay mine off in four years. And then they invest everything above and beyond what it takes to be out of debt in four years. But this is really more a question of strategy and uh, how you feel about debt uh, than it is necessarily a math question. Because every time you run the numbers mathematically, borrowing at two or three or four or five percent and earning at eight or ten percent, it's going to tell you to maximally leverage your life, borrow every cent you can and invest it all. Do you have any thoughts about that topic, Andrew? Yeah, you know, I, I think that if you get into that mentality of continuing to borrow, like, like you said, all of a sudden I'm starting to, you know, try to play all these games with my credit card as well and take out a ton of, you know, take out credit card debt on that and, and then maybe get a personal loan for, for something and buy a mortgage that's that's too big. It's two, three, four, five times my my income. And it just doesn't breed good good financial you know, mindset moving forward. And I think about 2007, 2008, when, you know, the housing crisis that, that happened. And, and part of that was people that were going out there and getting mortgages and buying things on, on credit above and beyond what they thought. And guess what happened? Well, at some point, everything came toppling down. And I'm not saying that that, that would potentially happen to you out there, but it can. When you get over levered, you know, the, the chances of your returns going up is, is great, but the chances of you losing a lot of money also goes up. So I'm of the mentality of maxing out those retirement accounts and, and paying your loans down, you know, because you're not guaranteed to get a 7% rate of return on your investment every year. You know, the market fluctuates. We have some great years. We have some some bull runs, and we also have times when the market tanks. So, you know, that's a, that's a great point. I mean, uh, yes, you can earn eight or 10% maybe in your investments, but that's risky. 
paying off a 5% student loan, that's guaranteed. You yeah. know, if you look around at your guaranteed investments right now, I mean, maybe you get one or 2% off a high yield savings account or a CD, um, you know, that's as good as it gets, but you got a three and a half percent mortgage or 4% student loan. That's a 4% guaranteed return you can get. Mm -hmm. And uh, that looks really attractive next to bonds and CDs these days. Um, the next question from Aldo Del Sol is pretty similar. Do you recommend paying student loan debt ASAP or investing your money and taking longer to pay the student loans? Here's what I've found. You know, this assumes you're not going for forgiveness. So your plan isn't to get PSLF forgiveness after 10 years. Your plan is not to get IDR forgiveness after 20 or 25 years. You're actually planning to pay them off. I meet very, doc very few doctors who are five plus years out of residency who don't wish they didn't have any student loans. And so my general recommendation is try to get rid of them within five years of coming out of your training. And if you are on track to pay them off in three, four or five years, invest everything above and beyond that. I think that's perfectly fine. You don't have to, you don't have to pay them off in nine months to be good at managing your money. You can drag them out for a little while, but I think you'll regret it. If you drag them out to mid career and longer, I think you're going to feel like you're locked into your career. You're going to have fewer choices. You're not going to take as much risk with your investments or with your career. And I think you're going to feel the weight of that hanging over your head. I just don't think you should drag them out that long, even if the interest rates are low. All right. Next question. This one comes from, uh, this must be off the subreddit because it's from New York Ice Cream, who's asking, would you recommend refinancing our federal loans if offered three to 4% after the current APR freeze and any possible extensions? Or should we hold out and wait to see if some possible forgiveness occurs? I think they're talking about that forgiveness we mentioned at the at the top of the hour, the ten thousand yeah. dollars, fifty thousand dollars. Some senators are talking about. Yeah. Uh, what do you think? It sounds like they're planning on paying it off. It sounds like they're not going for PSLF. Should they refinance, Andrew, or should they hold out hope of uh, of getting that forgiveness? Yeah, I mean, if they're they're in the boat where they're just going to end up paying these off probably just best to rip the band-aid off private refinance you get the cash back you get the low negotiated rates they're going to throw in the fire your financial advisor course it's going to help you figure out all the other aspects of your finances and you know if for some reason uh, you know there there is some type of forgiveness i guess you could leave ten thousand out there for a little bit longer but uh you know i there's 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 not much leaning towards that there is going to be that loan forgiveness. So they're they're in a, a situation, get that interest rate from 7% to, to two and a half, three or four. Yeah, let's be honest. Let's talk politics for just a minute. Right now, the Democrats control the House. They control the Senate. They control the White House. One of those is probably going to change in a year and a half. Uh, chances are good. Typically, uh, you know, the, the president's party loses seats in Congress mm -hmm. at the midterm. That's typical. And so chances are you only have a year and a half where Democrats are controlling all three of those. And then it's probably a matter of years after that before Democrats control all three again. And I'll tell you what, there's not a lot of appetite among Republicans for just across the board student loan forgiveness like this. And so if the Democrats aren't talking about it as being a major priority right now, I don't see it happening for a long time, not while you're managing your student loans. So I don't wouldn't hold out much hope at all for across the board massive forgiveness it's going to move the needle for you yeah All right, and, go ahead. And even, even if there is some something that comes up maybe in, in one of these infrastructure bills about uh, student loan forgiveness the, the republican side could use that is you know when the midterm elections come up that hey they they added this to to you know that infrastructure bill so they could use that as ammo for making the case for you know, trying to shift power so all right, our next question uh, is coming in from Viking Merce. Says, is the money forgiven under 20-year forgiveness or a 10-year PSLF taxable as income the year it is forgiven? I don't want to bank on that with repay. If it's going to balloon, I'll end up paying income taxes that are nearly the balance of the current loan. You want to take that one? Yeah, so... Finally, um, one that's a fact-based one, not an opinion-based one, right? Yeah, so we do know if you're doing the long-term income-driven repayment forgiveness, I'm talking about... If you're not doing PSLF in 10 years, you're looking for the 20 year and pay or the 25 year and repay or income based repayment. That is taxable. If it, you know, 20 years from now, it's, it's going to be right now as, as it stands, it would be taxable in the future. They could waive that. They could change that. But for now, what we know is that in that year, let's say that you had $500,000 of student loans 
outstanding after making 20 years of, of small payments and pays you earn. Let's say it's five hundred thousand dollars and you're in a I'm can use a whole number, 50% tax bracket. That would be a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar tax bill in addition to what you would already be paying in taxes in, in a, a normal year. So you know, what do you do to, to mitigate that is you start a side fund, you start putting money aside to do that. So yes, it is taxable. Public service loan forgiveness is not taxable. Yep. So it's really important. Those are your lump, the questioner is lumping them together and the tax situation with them is totally different. Yep. PSLF, 10 years, tax free. IDR, 20 to 25 years, taxable. Uh, very important to understand the two differences there. All right, next question, ASAP Doc says, I'm on repay and want to figure out the best way to make the most of my money. Do I just pay the interest rate every month so my total amount of loans does not increase and put the rest in a Roth IRA? Or should I not put money in a Roth and put all the money into student loans? At what point should I switch from repay to private refinance? I'm going into radiology and am an intern. So part of that we've addressed. It's the old investing versus paying down debt question. And, uh, you know, if you're not maxing out your Roth IRA as a, as a resident and you're planning on paying off your student loans eventually, um, you know, I think that's fine to max out your Roth IRA and, and pay the minimum on your payments during residency. Let's be honest though, you're not going to become rich as a resident, right? Residency is about learning medicine. It's about making sure nothing really bad happens to you financially with disability and life insurance. It's about making sure you have the right plan for your student loans. It's about making sure you're hitting the ground running when you become an attending. So you've got a good financial plan in place, but you're not going to save your way to wealth as a resident. You just don't make enough money. And uh, you're probably moving backwards as far as net worth goes during residency if you're like most docs. Um, so uh, honestly, at that point, I think it's, it's more about making sure you're managing your student loans optimally than whether you're paying more down on them or whether you're investing more money. I think either one is reasonable. At what point do you switch from repay to private refinancing? I suppose it's all about effective tax rate, wouldn't you say, Andrew? Yeah. So, I mean, I mean, if if you're in the camp where you want to keep the door open for public, you're not positive that you're going to go into private practice for radiology. You could ride your loans out in revised pay as you are because there is an interest subsidy that you get while you're, you know, particularly in your intern year. You're, you made zero dollars the year before. So your payments are going to be zero dollars for that first year, and then your your second year of, of your residency PGY two it's going to be based on half of your resident salary. So those first couple of years, your effective interest rate after the repay subsidy is applied, if let's say your loans were at seven percent, you're probably really going to be paying three and a half, three and three quarters, up to four percent those first couple of years. So you know that that's that's a great way to take advantage of the revised pays you earn plan. But if you're in, so if you're in the camp of, of keeping the door open, PSLF, you can stay in there, and then you know before you become attending and you take that private practice job, private refinance. Or if you're like, I'm absolutely positive, I'm going to private, uh, going to private practice, or I'm not going to work at a 501c3 or not for profit. At the moment that you can find a private lender who can give you a better rate than what you're paying after the effective interest rate uh, in, in uh, revised pays you earn that's when you can private refinance. And you're not gonna be hit with those large monthly payments while a resident, you'll get the $100 monthly payments if, if you work with a number one of the, a number of the lenders that work with residents, so. Awesome, all right, uh, thanks for what you do. You're gonna be a radiologist, I guess, currently in your intern year. So radiology is my favorite consultant. I call the radiologists all the time and talk to them. All right, next question comes from Wolfpack DO. Hey, Dr. Dolly, I'm a second year internal medicine resident. I consolidated my federal student loans with the intent to apply for PSLF when I qualify and haven't thought about them since. As the end of forbearance approaches and I have a better idea about my future plans after residency, is it still smarter to continue with these federal loans at the higher interest rate while staying eligible for PSLF or to refinance at a lower interest rate with the knowledge that most physicians in the fellowship I'm going to pursue, endocrinology, go into private practice? Uh, I hope when you're saying forbearance, your loans aren't actually in forbearance. I hope you're talking about this federal student loan holiday. Um, obviously, forbearance, deferment, these are like the worst things you can do during your training. And the reason why is none of those payments count toward PSLF or IDR forgiveness. Uh, yet there's still uh, interest is being added on, added on, right. added on. Uh, so it's really a terrible way to manage your student loans during residency and fellowship. 
Um, so if you are in forbearance, get out of forbearance. So at least your payments start counting uh, toward forgiveness. But it sounds to me like you're not sure if you're going to go for PSLF yet. And the answer is, if you're not sure, don't get out of the federal loan system. Only once you're sure do you want to refinance. So would you agree with that, Andrew? Yeah, you know that was really similar to the last question. If, if you're not sure, keep them federal, and you know you're you're going to be able to to keep your options open if if you ended up you know having a long you know training period and then doing PSLF, or you, you can always change your mind. Yes, there might be a little bit more that you end up paying out, but weighing that with the opportunity of getting public service loan forgiveness and just pulling the rug out from under that, I keep that option open for now. So this next question is one I've never seen before, which I'm excited. I, I, I don't get a lot of questions I've never seen before, but this one I haven't gotten. From Jet Spaceman asks, can you comment on going for PSLF while doing a fellowship outside of the U.S., for instance, in Canada for a year? Is that simply a lost year in terms of payments? What would you recommend for managing the loan during that year with the long-term plan of PSLF? Do the pay and repay plans work in Canada? Yes. So, the, <laughs> what, you know, let's let's talk a little bit about some of the requirements for public service loan forgiveness. Um, number one is you have to have qualifying loans. That's direct federal loans. Or if you had fell loans, consolidating those over to direct federal loans, a direct federal consolidated loan. Um, you have to work full time. And, you know, what does full time mean? It means it's usually about 30 hours or whatever your employer considers full time. And, and uh, you have to be in a a qualifying repayment plan, you know, like an income driven repayment plan, and you have to have qualifying employment. As long as that employer in Canada or wherever you are working is categorized as a 501c3 or a non for profit, yes, those payments would qualify. As long as but you is there, is there anybody in Canada that's a 501c3 according to the US? That's, I suspect that's there great, isn't. I, yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I know that you why, can- Why would can, a Canadian employer qualify under the US tax system as a 501c3? <laughs> I, I don't think any of them do. So I think it probably is a lost year, right? A, a yeah. Canadian government employer is not going to count with them, right? It's got to be a US government employer, I think. Yeah, I mean that's that's something where I would reach out reach out to your loan servicer, but you know maybe that would be would be a lost year if, if it's yeah. not categorized and, and fits those parameters because they are extremely strict letter of the law rules for for PSLF. So. Yeah, I, I I think you're gonna have a really hard time finding an employer that qualifies while you're in Canada. Now maybe if it's some sort of unique thing, you're actually an employee of a U.S. university and they're just having you up there for a year or something. Maybe you can still get somebody to sign off on it that's going to qualify. Uh, but I suspect that's going to be a lost year for you. Sounds like a great opportunity, but it's going to cost you some money, uh, probably in the form of less forgiveness down the line. Okay, Kashmir79 asks a question that's about four paragraphs. Let's read the too long, didn't, didn't read version. Can you comment on when it may be a good strategy for a married couple to file taxes separately in order to minimize IBR payment amounts on the road to forgiveness. This is this is like your bread and butter. This is what you spend all day talking to clients about, Andrew. Uh, and if there were just a rule of thumb that everybody could follow, uh, studentloanadvice.com wouldn't be in business because this is something people come and talk to you all day about and you help them run the numbers, right? Yeah. What kind, of, uh, what kind of general comments can you make about uh, about married filing separately as a strategy? Yeah, you know, it's because if, if you go out there and you try to find a cookie cutter answer, it, it's pretty easy when, when, when you're single or you're the only earner in the household. You probably just enroll and repay and, and follow that out until you get PSLF or private refinance. But in the situation where you're, you're married, you're dual earners, you know, maybe one of you has loans or maybe you both have loans, then it just it notches up everything a little bit. It makes it a little more complex. But let's let's take kind of a, a general case that I meet a lot with where one person is in attending they've already paid off their loans and their spouse is in their is in their residency still so they're probably making sixty thousand dollars and let's assume that they've got three hundred thousand dollars of student loans and they're going to end up wanting to go for uh, public service loan forgiveness but what happens is let's say their their uh, resident spouse is making 300 and they're making 50 as a resident so their student loan payments will be based off three hundred and fifty thousand dollars of income and if they stay on track for that towards PSLF, you know, they probably would have paid their loans off beforehand. But the way to 
keep your student loan payments much lower is through kind of a loophole that's called this married filing separately. Uh, and uh, we've, we've written a, an extensive blog post about it that you can find on White Coat Investor or Student Loan Advice. If you just search, you know, how should I file my taxes, that would pull up. But really what it would do is it would allow your student loan payments to be based off of strictly the, the resident's income. And then once they become a fel excuse me, an attending, it would still just be based off theirs if they file their taxes separately. Because what happens is the student loan servicers every single year require you to file an annual income certification form. And it's based on what your income was. And if you're and if, if you file your taxes jointly, it's based on what your household income is. If you file your taxes separately, then it's based on what you've made as an individual. And that can usually be, that can save people tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars in the long run of their student loan payment journey. That's if you're going for PSLF. Yeah, I mean, usually you're basically comparing paying more in taxes with getting more in forgiveness because you're paying less in student loans. And so it's a, it's a comparison, it's a calculation. And the problem is you don't necessarily know everything you need going forward to make that calculation. You don't know what you're going to make for the next 10 or 20 years. You don't know exactly what's going to happen with taxes. Uh, you don't know exactly what you know retirement accounts you're going to have available to you. So there's a lot of guesswork and a lot of assumptions that go into, into this calculation. It's complicated. Um, but the bigger the difference between your income and your spouse's income, you know, I mean, and you have relatively low income, the higher your student loans, uh, the more likely this sort of a scenario is going to work out well for you. And, you know, and I, I should add one other point that I, I left out is that if you're. And I think we've got you back. There okay. You are. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> my apologies on my end. So in, in this situation, if this couple was in revised pay as you earned, regardless of how they file their taxes, it would be their uh, student loan payment would be based on their household income. So if you're going to want to end up filing your taxes separately and reducing your student loan payment, make sure you're in pay as you earn your income based repayment. Okay. Good advice. All right. Next one comes from ridiculous doc who unfortunately has ridiculous loans. Hi, my wife and I owe around $800,000 in student loans combined. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. We are saving a load of cash right now in high yield savings account. We're planning to pay off all the student loans by the end of the year, beginning of next year with a lump sum. That's awesome. So apparently those student loans were a pretty good investment if you've been able to save up enough to pay them off in one lump sum. That will depend on when the student loan interest freeze ends. Is it worth the headache to refinance our loans with five different companies to get the bonus prior to paying it off to at least get extra bonuses in return? Are we not allowed to do that? Um, well, you're allowed to do that. Is it worth the hassle? I don't know. If I had $800,000 sitting in cash and and this is going to go, I'm going to start earning interest or paying interest on my loans again come October 1st. I'd probably pay them off. I mean, let's be honest. If you can save up enough to pay off $800,000 student loan, 800, in student loans at once, this isn't going to be what makes you wealthy, arbitraging that difference for a few months, right? You're clearly making enough money and saving enough money that you are going to be wealthy. You are not going to have financial problems in your life. And so I, I don't know that I'd mess around with all this complexity of trying to get $300, $500 uh, at a time. If you want to refinance it once or twice, okay, I guess that makes sense. Get yourself your fire, your financial advisor course. Don't get me wrong. I get paid when you refinance through those links too. So we want you to refinance, um, but I'm not sure I would mess around with this too long. If you're in this situation where you can just pay off your student loans, you know, maybe you wait until October 1st when they start costing you interest again. Um, but I don't think I'd drag this out much longer than that. I think I'd just pay it off and be done with it. Um, certainly the lenders, some of them, some of them don't care. Some don't care if you refinance every week with them because they're selling off your loan to somebody else. And so they make money every time they do it. But a few of the lenders actually hold on to your loans, right? And if you're refinancing two months after you refinance with them, uh, they actually lose money on you. So they don't like that so much. And some of them have thought about, you know, preventing people from doing these serial refinancing and getting the bonuses on it just because it's costing them money. So maybe if a lot of people were doing this, the bonuses wouldn't be there or wouldn't be as high as they are now. Um, so in that respect, maybe it's not such a good idea, but I'm not sure that as an individual, you couldn't come out a few hundred dollars ahead by bouncing around a few times before you actually paid these off. All right. Our next question comes from Ashim13. Hello, I'm a new attending, owe approximately $450,000 in student loans. 
which is refinanced with SoFi at 2.67%. I'm currently in the 15-year repayment plan, but my goal is to knock them out. Uh, my plan is to pay the minimum $3,100 a month and invest the equivalent amount $3,100 a month into a taxable account, probably something safe like total stock market or 500 index fund. After about five years of growth in these accounts, I was going to use the funds in the accounts and pay off the loans. Is this something reasonable? I figured if I could get a growth of 7% from the investments, it would at least help me to pay off the loans a little quicker. Appreciate any thoughts. Thank you. You're adding some risk well, there. You're adding risk. What? How are you going to feel if this is your plan and the market drops 45% this fall? Because sometimes it does that. You know, in 2008, the market dropped 40, 50%. And if that was your plan, you would really be kicking yourself to have not put it toward your loans. On the other hand, if we get years like the last five years where the market has done very, very well, you'll look like a genius. But this is not a risk-free strategy. You're taking some risk in hopes of paying off your loans a little bit sooner. What do you think, Andrew? Reasonable yeah. amount of risk to take? Yeah, I, Split the difference? Right. What would you do? I mean, I'm just picturing this person they've waited 10 years and they've saved up $500,000 in some taxable account. And all of a sudden the market tanks and their money is worth only, you know, it's worth a fraction of that. And then they can't end up paying off their loans in that year, which could certainly happen. Right. You know, last year, Mar the market dropped like 30 or 40% in a few days. And what if you would have gotten scared and sold all your money, sold all your stocks and your bonds and whatnot then, you know, and I, I just, I would take out that guesswork. Just, you know, if, if you're putting money into your retirement account, you know, you're maxing those out and you're able to make student loan payments. And there's no issue in making prepayments when you've done a private refinance loan. Having that 15 year loan and then paying it like a 10 or a seven or a five. You know, I know a lot of people that are like, I'm going to lock in the 20 year and then I'm going to pay it like a five or a 10 because the interest rate isn't that different. So, yeah, I, I, I've messed around with stuff like this in my life, right? we probably could have paid off our mortgage a year or two sooner than we did. We said, it's only 2.75%. We'll, we'll leave it invested or we'll invest it. And then we'll use that to pay off the loans. Well, we paid off the loans with new money. We never can't, we never cashed out those investments. And in the end, we just realized this is not going to make the difference in our financial lives. This is not what's going to make us wealthy. What's going to make us wealthy is going to work, building our business, you know, having a good savings rate, investing it in some reasonable amount and stay in the course for a decade or two. That's what makes you wealthy. You know, not playing these little games with credit cards or with your student loans and trying to arbitrage the difference between 2.67% guaranteed and 7% maybe, you know, that's just not what makes you wealthy. But if you want to try it with a little bit of your money, it's not crazy, right? There's a good chance you'll come out ahead, but it is a bit of a gamble. All right, an email here from Robert. Uh, he says, I took out some international student loans using Prodigy Finance. Since doing so, my green card has come through and I'm now looking to transfer my loans to a US provider, but struggling to find a US lender who will do the transfer. I'm looking for a list of companies who could offer a US-based loan for these international loans, but I'm a bit confused by the whole thing, to be honest. I'm studying the US at a US college and Prodigy Finance is set up as a US lender wasn't a consideration I factored in that this was an international loan or that traditional U.S. lenders wouldn't be able to offer the loans. Got any advice for Robert? Yeah, you know, I, I haven't really come across this very often in, in consults. I usually see it where somebody has done, meta, you know, done school here in, in the U.S. and then they've now moved to another country and they're, they're trying to get that figured out. I know that sometimes that can be difficult when they're domiciled outside of the US, but I, you know, there should be some, some lenders that can work with you. Uh, but, but in particular with your international student loans, I think you do have to have credit history in the US and job history here. And as that builds up, it should be, be easier for you to then have them moved over to a federal loan service, or excuse me, a private uh, US loan servicer. Now, I think this becomes an issue for a lot of people going to Caribbean schools. A lot of times they don't have access to the U.S. student loan system. And so they end up with these 10% private loans, and they're really terrible loans, and, and just oh, gobs and gobs of money by the time they're done with their residency or fellowship. Um, and so I think refinancing for them, uh, whenever they can do it, is usually a good move. But one thing you could do maybe if now you qualify for U.S. loans, for federal loans, is you could 
take out a little bit more money than maybe you need and put the difference toward your other loans. So in effect, you're kind of refinancing those loans. That might be an option. Um, not to mention your, your, your federal loans would then be eligible for IDR programs and repay well, forgiveness and PSLF and all that. Um, but I don't necessarily have a list of people that are going to refinance you during school. You know, for the most part, these refinancing companies are, you got to at least be a resident. We're lucky they'll refinance residents. You know, it wasn't that many years ago when you couldn't even refinance your loans as a resident. Mm -hmm. All right. Time's getting short, but uh, we got a few more questions here. If you have something you want us to ask, go ahead and put that into the comments on Facebook there and we'll get to those. Um, this one comes from uh, off Instagram story, actually, from CR DeSaro. Advice for med students and not pinching too many pennies while living off loans. You know, I usually see the opposite problem. <laughs> the problem is people are living it up way too much while they're on student loans. They forget that by the time they pay these things off, they're really paying three times the sticker, sticker price for everything they buy. But I suppose there's probably some people on the other side of the spectrum, too, that are just being too crazy frugal during medical school. Um, and so you've got to, uh, you know, find a balance there. If you're going on $20,000 vacations on your student loans, you're probably doing it all wrong. But at the same time, if you're not eating anything but ramen during medical school, maybe you've gone too far on that spectrum. So you got to find a balance. Realize you'll be glad you kept your loans down as much as you could when you become an attending and start paying them back. But at the same time, when you're an attending physician, you're going to be making ten to $40,000 a month, right? So you're going to be able to pay off these student loans. Even if you borrow a little too much, it just means you got to live like a resident for a few more months than you would otherwise. So it's not the end of the world if you want to spend a little bit of money. But do try to be generally frugal during your medical school or dental school. What do you think, Andrew? You're uh, you're a little bit closer to being in school than I am. You got any advice for people on, on being cheap enough but not too cheap while they're in school? Yeah, um, I mean, so, something that you can do is finding cheap hobbies is, is a great thing to do. I, I love to, to hike, um, but but I also love to golf. But, you know, and golf's an expensive hobby. So I tended to do more of the hiking, you know, while I was in college. And now I'm trying to take on some more golf. But it's just, just little things like that where you can you can look into, you know, what is this going to cost me right now when I'm in, in my residency or I'm in, in medical school? I, I probably just can't go out there and, and get that steak dinner once a week, uh, you know, but, but right, you, you don't want, I mean, you don't want to be rice and beans every single me meal. You want to be able to, to live a little bit and enjoy, uh, you know, your, your time while you're in school. Uh, but I think if you have a plan, um, you know, we, we, White Coat Investor has has ideas on, on getting a financial plan for what you can do. And then if you stick to that, that'll certainly help you feel better. Yeah, it's finding a balance. You know, you, you don't want to eat rice and beans every meal, but you shouldn't be eating steak and shrimp every meal either. <laughs> so find a balance in there. You know, I mean, truthfully, I, I meet a lot of people, pre-meds, medical students, they're just uh, really anxious and really worried about student loans. Well, going to medical school and borrowing the typical amount of medical student loans and coming out with the typical physician income is still a good investment. It really is. It's still a good idea to go to medical school and get that income. Um, but you do have to have a plan to take care of those student loans. And that plan is living like a resident for most people, you know, whether that's two years or four years or whatever, that's how you make it work out. And then after that, it's all gravy and you're totally ahead on making that investment. Uh, so don't feel guilty about living on student loans while you're in medical school. It's fine, right? Uh, I mean, there's other ways to pay for school. You can go work for the Indian Health Service. You can do what I did and go work for the military for a few years. But I tell you what, I would have come out way ahead financially if I'd borrowed the money than if I went and having gone into the military. I calculated hmm. it out one day. That was a mistake, by the way. Hmm. You shouldn't calculate that once you made your decision. But I came out about $180,000 behind by going through the military rather than just you know, taking out student loans and paying them off. Um, so it can be a good investment just to borrow student loans. Don't feel all guilty about it. Just make sure you have a plan to take care of them as you come out. All right, here's another question about living uh, on debt in school. If you have to buy a car during school, is it best to use loan money and pay gas or get a car loan? 
And when should you come up with your plan to pay loan debt off the second half of your fourth year? I think they're they're asking whether you should buy the car with student loans or whether you should buy the car with with a car loan. I just I don't think you're supposed to use your student loan. You're not supposed to use your student loan dollars from anything aside from paying your tuition and then you know the, the living expenditures, buying your books. So you know I'm sure that there's people doing it. They're probably not going to come out and audit you if you put money towards a car loan. But I, I try to live close to campus, ride a bike, take the bus, do anything that I needed to so I didn't have to take out a car loan at that time. Yeah, for sure. I rode a bike and rode the bus. We had one car in, uh, when we were in medical school, and Katie had it most of the time going to her externships. Um, so if you can avoid the car at all, that's the best. Yeah. But if you have to have a car for whatever reason, then buy an inexpensive car, right? If you will get a five or six thousand dollar car, and right now cars are insane, I know, so yeah. that might be an eight thousand dollar car or whatever. Instead of a thirty thousand dollar car, I don't think it matters all that much whether you get a car loan or whether you use some extra money from your student loans. It's true when you sign your promissory note, you say you're just going to use it for educational expenses. But if you need a car to get to your rotations, I guess technically that's an educational expense. Um, so I think either is fine. The key is not to buy some incredible car. Buy a five or six. $8,000 car or something like that. And it's likely to not only get you through school, but to get you through residency. And at that point, you can just buy a new car out of your cash flow, save up for two or three months, drop 30 or $40,000 on a car, and uh, and you'll never have to deal with another car loan in your entire life. So um, I think either one's fine. When should you come up with a plan to pay it off? Um, it's always good to be planning. Um, I think as you move out of medical school into your intern year, I think that's a much easier time to do planning because now you can kind of put a budget together, you know what your income is going to be. Um, and so that's probably the right time to really be thinking about money. Your main focus in medical school should be just trying to live as frugally as you can. All right. Uh, last question here comes from Audrey Jensen. Invest versus repay loans and residency. I've got Fed loans at 7% before the interest freeze. I have no work 401k, but I'm already maxing out the Roth IRA. Classic question. We get it all day long, right? Invest yeah. and pay off your loans. I like the fact that you're maxing out a Roth IRA already. And if you don't have a work 401k and you're planning on paying off your loans, you're not going for DSLF or IDR forgiveness. Sure. Put the rest towards your student loans. You might even be a good person to refinance during residency. Well, maybe you can get 5% instead of 7%. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're going to be paying them off anyway. Yeah. And, you know, and at, at a certain point, you know, you're probably going to be phased out of just contributing to a Roth IRA and you'll have to start doing a backdoor Roth IRA. So, yeah, it, it's a great idea to, you know, I, I always say starting to invest and, and paying down loans concurrently is is probably the optimal plan for you moving forward. OK, well, our hour is up, Andrew. If people need more help on their student loans, if they have a complicated situation, they need help running the numbers or they need confirmation that their plan is the right one, that they're choosing the right IDR, that they're max, that they're using the right retirement accounts, that they're filing their taxes the right way, how can they get in touch with you? Yeah, just go to studentloanadvice.com or you can just email me at andrew at studentloanadvice.com. Be, be happy to you know, re review your situation. And you know, if you just need help, you're starting from scratch, we'll take you from there. Or if you're already experienced, and you have a good idea on your plan, but you just wanted to get vetted and make sure that you're on the right track, we'll, we'll review it. We'd be happy to, to do that and, and send you on your way with, with some financial peace in terms of what, what to do with your loans, getting out of debt as soon as possible. My dad, your host, Dr. Dahl, is a practicing emergency physician, blogger, author, and podcaster. He is not a licensed accountant, attorney, or financial advisor, so this podcast is for your entertainment and information only and should not be considered official, personalized financial advice.